interesting session. Um, I'll you know, take off from where all three speakers have uh, uh, talked. Uh, let me first look at, um, and basically I'll, I'll talk on inequality in the world um, and uh, the, what the IMF, if you will, is saying or perhaps is saying, globalization, um, and then move on to growth, uh, both in the world and in India, and then finally uh, end up with this inflation phenomenon. You know, what, what I found very striking, which I, I really like that chart, which is um, the jobs growth um, and uh, which countries uh, think that uh, globalization is good. And it's almost a perfect, you know, uh, inverse fit with per capita income. Uh, obviously, there'll be some outliers, but it's a very, very telling chart uh, and very, very useful, I think, of uh, describing uh, attitudes uh, towards uh, globalization. Um, you know, the IMF has made a lot about world inequality and um, about world inequality deteriorating or <coughs> words to that effect. Um, maybe they haven't been, uh, um, if you will, as careless, and I'll, I'll soon uh, say why uh, the entire notion of world inequality worsening uh, is just plain, simply wrong. Um, it is, and indeed, even if you were to concentrate, uh, and this relates to that chart, actually, uh, if you were to concentrate in even uh, the US and UK, it turns out that these are the two countries that have shown a deterioration in inequality, um, and if you will, perhaps a sharp deterioration, but all of that has stabilized for the last 15 years. So either we are talking about um, you know, some other world, uh, but if you're talking about this world, the very simple fact, and here's very, very intuitive, um, China and India together take care of about 38% of the world's population. Since, uh, no matter how you measure it, whether you measure it in dollar terms or per PPP terms, since 1980, that's the last 35 years, uh, per capita income in these two countries, which are the poorest countries back in 1980, uh, has grown at something like 6% per annum. And per capita income in the rich, developed Western world uh, has grown at one and a half. So you don't need any math to really come to the conclusion that world inequality has really, really improved. And indeed, uh, I update my work from 2002 on, uh, if you will, biannual, on an annual basis. And as soon as the WEO data comes out, I try and update. And inequality in the world today is back to the levels of 1870. It peaked in 1970, and today inequality in the world is back to the low levels, if you will, or high levels, but certainly much, much lower. So the first comment is that we have to be very careful uh, about what we say about inequality, and we have to be rather specific, and we have to be rather, if you will, concentrate on the time period. There's data available. The IMF has the data. Uh, everybody has the data. So therefore, it's very easy to uh, look at it and come to the conclusion that indeed this is either a completely American uh, dominated and, and uh, England dominated, if you will, impression, but certainly doesn't conform to any of the facts that we see on the ground. Um, now, coming to world growth, um, it is the case that, and you know, uh, you've pointed out that it has gone up or is, uh, to 3.4%. Um, my impression is around 3, 3.5 uh, is close to, if you will, the 60th percentile of world growth in the last 40, 50 years. So it is bad, it's not at 90th percentile or whatever, but 3.4, and if you get to 3.8 or so, it'll be in the top 20% of every, any year uh, of world growth. So, um, and I'll, I'll soon come to why I think we are perhaps likely uh, to get to uh, 3.8 in the next few years. Um, Indian growth, and this is, you know, 
since this is an Indian audience, I was, uh, let me just point out a little bit of a problem that I see uh, with the IMF forecast of, you know, 7.6% forever. Uh, very nice, it's a highest uh, growing economy, but, you know, weather is a, a factor. Agriculture accounts for 15% of GDP uh, in India. And agriculture for the last two years has grown at zero, maybe 0.5. And because of the good weather, et cetera, it's gone liable to grow at 7, 8%. Uh, area has just gone up by 4%. And so you can add a little bit of productivity growth or whatever it is. So it'll be a big surprise given, unless some sector in India has to decline, that basically agriculture is going to add on its own, Keras Paribus, all other things being equal, a full percentage point to GDP growth. So either you have to maintain, or the IMF has to maintain, that agriculture's go by 1%, and one full percentage point is going to be a loss in something, uh, maybe construction, maybe industry, or whatever. But I, I think it needs to be uh, articulated as to why your IMF is sticking to, if India is an important, or rising to be an important player, as to why somebody didn't concentrate on just getting uh, that thing, or maybe a footnote to say, despite the good weather, despite the area allocation, despite the fact that we had two years of drought, successive years, which is only the fifth time in Indian history since 1871 that you've had two successive years of drought. So most commonsensical uh, interpretation would be that, you know, you'll add. So therefore, either the world slows down or something radical goes wrong, that in India, uh, for the next year, uh, that it is liable to be uh, much higher than the 7.6 percent. And uh, if you will, that will conform to what the other uh, discussions have said, that look, you know, every time you come in, you know, uh, it comes out lower, it will be now counter to that. Maybe that is why <laughs> it has been done, that we know for certain, almost certain, uh, that the Indian growth is going to be higher, so the, maybe the world growth will be revised up. I think. I, I really think the world growth is in a, uh, you know, more than half full uh, vision of mine. Now, I come to the last part, which is on disinflation. Uh, and, you know, the American, the global financial Western crisis uh, leads most people to believe that inflation or disinflation set in after the global crisis. Well, it turns out that 96 to 2004, or let me give 1980 to 1995, the median inflation rate in developing countries, uh, developed economies, was 5.4. 96 to 2004, it was 2%. That's your average median inflation rate in developed economies. Then in 2013, if you will, it was 1.2, and 2014 to 15, and 16, it's close to 0 0.5. So the fact that we have been seeing global disinflation, and if you will, for the emerging markets, is basically the gap used to be about three and a half percentage points, and now it's about three percentage points. So therefore, even for uh, developing economies, the latest estimate for 2014 to 16, the median inflation, CPI, Okay, the, the GDP deflator is a lot lower. The median inflation rate in developing economies is 3.9. So I think the biggest phenomena in the world, and not brought on by the global financial crisis, but nevertheless a mega phenomena, is disinflation, or low inflation, or if you will. Um, now this has, you know, if you will, consequences for everything that we think about, whether we're thinking about interest rates uh, in the developed economies or, so, you know, this is a, a universal. So India was the exception 2004 to 2014, and I won't go into the reasons for that because that'll take us off on a tangent. But disinflation is related to, in my mind, completely to globalization. And that is a phenomenon that I don't think uh, uh, has been either appreciated in f as far as inflation is concerned, and if you will, that it is not going to go away. Uh, so if, if we think that we can suddenly inflate our way out of trouble, if you see trouble, uh, I think you, you're looking at something that uh, is not there. Last point on this, and this is, I think, again, 
um, all of us here, certainly on this table, and most, in this, most people in the audience, have been brought up in a world of inflation. We really do not know, and I'm including myself, how to think about a world of really zero inflation. And if you will, we suffer from, and we were brought up in the Keynesian uh, economics, if you will, or even monetarist economics, with money illusion. And that drives our thinking, and in many countries, that drives the policies. If you will, the US, and I think now they will change it, they have a target rate, if I'm not mistaken, of 3% on the Fed funds rate for 2019, uh, which means, you know, I, I, where 3% and with 1%, 2% inflation, um, and with slowing growth, if you will, uh, is something, so all I'm saying is, this is a phenomena we all need to worry about, we all need to think about more than worry about, and this has consequences for our interpretation of growth. Um, now, Marty Feldstein has been talking about this for two years, um, and I'm sure you're aware of the, a lot of discussion as to, you know, to what extent are we, if we are mismeasuring inflation by even about 50 basis points in the Western world. That solves all your puzzles. And you know, productivity growth is basically a long term, if you look at the productivity growth for the US, where the data are the most accurate, most research, et cetera, it's a step function. And the step function, if you will, has come down, and that's what we are talking about, but basically 0.5% is all it takes for productivity growth in the US to be completely normal for the uh, GDP growth in the US to be completely normal, um, and everything else to be very normal. So if the US is growing at 2.1%, and maybe we are mismeasuring uh, inflation by 50 basis points, that's 2.6%. That's not so bad at a, for the most developed economy in the world. So all I'm saying is, I, I really think that the glass is much more than half full. There are problems with disinflation or very low inflation that all of us economists, especially, uh, and those who advise governments, need to think about and work our way through. I do not have the answer. But all I'm saying is the disinflation phenomena is here to stay as far as the eye can see. Thank you. Arvind has to leave uh, very quickly. So you have two questions you're saying. One is that, um, you know, uh, the whole China thing uh, with this buildup of uh, NPAs and uh, indebtedness, this struggle between, you know, short term you keep up uh, pump priming the economy, you build up debt. I'd like you to, you know, give a sense of how this kind of the end game plays out. Is it going to be capital outflows, decline in the exchange rate? Uh, world deflation, or is it going to be, you know, they chug along, they're going to keep it in check, uh, but how does this debt problem ultimately get resolved in China? So if you could help us think through that uh, would be great. The second question I is related is that, you know, several people including Daniel Gross and others have said that a big part of the, you know, the, the slowing globalization is just commodity prices. A and, and, and so the corollary being that as commodity prices decline, therefore you will see, you know, globalization, uh, you know, or at least trade uh, picking back again. And I was in Singapore and, and uh, you know, Tharman uh, Shanmugaratnam, he, he believes that also uh, very strongly. So, uh, because that has implications for the outlook, you know, how much is commodities, how much is much more structural, uh, whatever, globalization, et cetera. Uh, so if you could, you know, r respond to these two, I would be, you know, delighted. Um, you know, on the commodity prices, um, you know, the, the measures we saw, we showed, I mean, it's true in, you know, it's true in real terms. So it's not just commodity prices. It's true when you look at volumes. Um, it's particularly true in manufacturing. It's less so in services. But it's like a real thing. It's not a figment of, of mismeasuring. Uh, uh, you, of course, do see it in nominal terms as well, even more sharply because of the fall in oil particularly, but it's not just a commodity phenomenon. You know, in China, 
And Arjit mentioned this, so I'll just bring it up now. You know, he, he talked about all of the transitions that are going on. And with the exception of the energy transition, you can, you can view a lot of the recent experience as um, the government trying to slow down some of those transitions in order to maintain the targeted growth rate that is a political imperative. And um, that, that entails a buildup of certain vulnerabilities in the corporate sector and the banks, excess capacity, um, support of sunset industries, which, and, and misallocation of resources uh, to low productivity sectors, which have to, you know, over time take a toll on productive capacity and the, the ability to support the kind of consumption that the Chinese authorities would like to bring about. So, you know, we have at the fund have been recommending to them, you know, give up the growth target, uh, go for something more moderate, but work on gradually reducing these imbalances so that growth is durable and sustainable. Because ultimately, um, there may have to be a more drastic um, reallocation of losses within the system, which, which could be disruptive to growth. And so our longer, our longer run forecasts for China do take into account that, that that may be a possibility, that there is some slowdown. But how that would look is very, um, it's very murky, because unlike most economies, the, 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 the Chinese authorities still exercise enough direct control to reallocate losses in ways that would be hard within um, uh, more decentralized settings. So I, I don't have a good answer for how that, how that looks, although it's, you know, it's doubtful that it wouldn't have some disruptive effect on, on production and employment. Well, we've seen a lot of, you know, I'm not going to give you a number because I don't, I don't know what to say about that. But, you know, we've seen a couple of bouts of financial um, instability that's fairly broad-based. <laughs> you know, we do see contagion across asset markets, although it's somewhat overrated compared to just the direct channels of contagion. Um, but... Um, you know, there, there, there could be a broader onset of risk aversion in financial markets caused by a fear that China is growing more slowly or that its trade is shrinking more rapidly. Um, uh, you know, we got through that the last, the last couple of times because the fundamentals for many economies weren't that weak. Uh, I think there are buffers um, in emerging markets. So I don't, I don't see a global meltdown coming, coming from that. But, uh, you know, there could be some tremors, for sure. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll take uh, some more questions. But before that, uh, I just want to say we will circulate the presentation. Please give us uh, your email addresses to Ramandeep, uh, if you can stand up so that we will see, or me. Uh, either of us uh, will make sure that you actually have the presentation. Then the colors, etc.